thank you again to Jan Åke Jønsson. Yeah, it must be great to be able to handle an instrument like that. Uh, many of us dream about that, but uh, it will only be a dream in this life. <laughs> um, I talked to some nice people out there, and um, this conference is also about you making relationships. And uh, I see a lot of n talking in groups out there, but if you are interested to expand your your possibilities to talk to other open-minded uh, people. I put out a, a piece of paper where you can write down your name and your email address and your telephone number and afterwards we will send an email to all of you and then you are able to connect with the people you resonate with. So if you're interested in expanding your network, uh, please uh, write on a, a piece of paper uh, contact list, it's right over there. Um, Carol will uh, introduce our next guest, uh, which will be on Skype. We have tested it and seem to work okay, but bear with us if we have any problems. Please, Carol. Well, well hi. Um, enjoying? Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dana Dunford. Maybe he's not very well known in, in Denmark, but he's doing a, a tremendous job um, concerning the Fukushima uh, horrible accident, tragedy, and the effect, the effects radiation has on all oceans, both the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, plus the coastlines. He has been working with this for many years, and he has a website, and he has um, very often, well, n almost daily, an uh, update on YouTube you can follow. Here's a man who has... <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, he lives in Canada, so there's eight hours uh, or nine hours behind. I mean, it's eight o'clock in the morning for him. Um, and he calls himself a nuclear protologist. He has been studying the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean for over 25 years, and being the skipper and lead diver on over a dozen commercial diving vessels and has done over 14,000 commercial deep sea diving hours. He just told me yesterday that for a couple of weeks he had another check of what is going on on the coastline of uh, Canada and I asked him to tell us what is going on in Europe and of course in Denmark if he, if he can. So he has one hour here. I hope you take well. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, then I don't fall. It's Skype, yeah. You, uh, you're up now, you have about 150 people looking at you now, so, so the scene is yours. Good luck. Get it to the share screen. And is my volume good? We're good to go. Okay, here we go then. Hi everyone, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. This is the studio, and it's a digital studio, and in order to tell the story, I had to create all of this. Now, Fukushima, as everybody knows, I hopefully, uh, but unfortunately not everybody knows, but hopefully everybody uh, is able to come to understand that this was an event we had up on our planet. And they have spent the equivalent of 
uh, $818 billion Canadian already in five years on the accident. So that should give you some kind of um, context of the gravity of what we're talking about. And... I can so. Good stuff. Okay. okay, so what you're looking at, everyone, uh, by the way, I wish I was there to talk to everybody. I was, when we originally set up to do this, uh, I was, I was going to come down there, but I'll explain that at the end of the video why it didn't come down. And so what you're looking at is a depiction of the people in the red that died along the coastline, and the yellow is the people that are missing. This is roughly a 400-kilometer span of the Japanese coastline. This was from this soon. We're going to show you about 100 pictures nonstop coming up. And so I encourage you uh, to strap yourselves in and hang on. Nuclear power plants in Japan. Now, what you're looking at is the, the Diachi. If you can see my cursor, you'll see that, that there is the Diachi plant. The Diachi had six, but there was also the Tokai, the Doini, and uh, Homoka plants. Now, they were in the exact same area as those people that died. And that was roughly this area you're looking at. The Dorney would have been around right there at the tip of that area. Now, I make this really simple for everybody. This is why the people died. And once again, let's refresh you. The people died in that 400 kilometers. So here we go. The people died... And some of these pictures are hard, but that's the reality. And they died because uh, there was a tsunami that came in at roughly around 600 miles per hour. When it hit shore, it slowed down to about 100 miles an hour. And then when you think about people in vehicles and everything, got no way of driving those speeds or knowing that they should drive those speeds to escape it. And uh, it's incomprehensible because you don't have straight lines to drive. And so it didn't matter because this country was ripped to pieces. For 400 kilometers minimum, this uh, was an event. There was no telephone poles obviously left over, no infrastructure, and then all the resources had to be put into rescuing and trauma and just um, chaos and disorganization. How can you organize for something so huge? And so then you come in after and... This is Unit 1 at Fukushima. Now, this building, um, it blew up and caught fire several times. This building, a reactor building, had a running reactor in it. The reactor had upwards of 60,000 rods. That is confirmed. That's what these reactors run on. And you take the rods out of the reactor and you put it up at the roof area uh, for about 10 years. And so every year to 18 months tops, they're going to have to take the fuel out, change that cycle, and put more fuel in the reactor. And so what you have, in other words, is roughly 10 years worth of fuel in the building. So you're not talking about a single reactor, you're talking about five or six reactor cores. Now, the reactor building itself, the structure of the building, uh, the poles are up at the top. These are where the poles are. Now that yellow bulb is the very top of the reactor. It's like a big bulb uh, that fits over that and you can see the rods the depiction of the rods and the, I'll show you these, some of these pictures over and over this is the heat signature from number two and the heat signature from number two where while the building looks like it's intact it is confirmed that we lost the entire inventory in that building also so that's building one building two is roughly around 12 reactor cores now are missing we're going to give you context coming up once again that's what the reactor building should look like now this is reactor three and here's another this is reactor four now both of these buildings in particular you don't have to really guess there's about this much of the building left at best and so then all the components are up high in the building like the reactor core itself and then the, the pools now this is a cutout of the front of the buildings it doesn't show you where all the inventory is in this particular cutter but it does give you some context now reactor four i want you to look at that yellow bulb reactor four obviously is gutted and you can see the enormity of the damage it's uh, incontestable that this uh, building is completely 
you can't put a coat of paint on it and solve that issue. Okay, so here's a quick uh, comparison. So you can see where the fuel pulls where five reactor cores are up high in the building are obviously missing from the reactor three. These are relatively close in scale, what you're looking at. This is reactor four, and at the top of reactor four in the model over here, you see the bulb. So the reactor core and parts of it is right there in front of it and behind it, and in the center is the the top of the torus. And so the building is completely, in, inventory is completely gone. Now they picked up 30 million one-ton bags, 30 million. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Now if you put that in the context, what you would think about is uh, 30 million one-ton trucks and put them bumper to bumper so they're scratching the paint off each other. Now, that's five uh, lanes of traffic right around the entire planet from four buildings so far in just a little tiny area. It's just a uh, percent of a percent of a percent of what's actually needed to be attempted to clean up. Was, And what they done was dug up the top six, seven inches. And this was something that I had come out and advocated for uh, originally, was that the just to start collecting it up rather than leaving it in the environment. One of the uh, remediations for nuclear was if you would find, say, a little tiny speck on your Geiger counter, you would walk back uh, 900 feet and you would start putting up uh, little signs. Now, that's before a little speck. And then you would put up a big fence around it with international warnings on it for people to stay away from that. Now, what would you do when your whole country is like that? instead of just a little speck in the middle of your country is an interesting question. But once again, um, five lanes of traffic right around the planet from four buildings. Uh, these bags are only meant to last a couple of years at best. They have over 10,000 sites. And this is, once again, just a tiny, tiny fraction. They use the homeless, the destitute, the immigrants to do this. You're not going to see Harvard or Yale or Berkeley or Stanford or Oxford or MIT, the big shakers and movers on this planet. So these um, aggregates are from e, e News, and they just link you right over to the mainstream article. So you would normally just click on that link, and you would go right directly to the Norwegian Institute for Air Research. And rather than do that, what we do is we, because you have a nice um, compacted headlines in order for you to get the context, it's a lot simpler. Latest forecast had all of California on a radiation threat. April 6, April 7, shows levels as high as in Japan. Uh, this is one of the models. Now, when you look at this, it's expanded all the way across at this point right here. Now, it's only based upon two isotopes from a single reactor. The model is based upon uh, iodine-131 with an eight-day half-life. And they used iodine-131 and 137. When you see that... Um, it's a, basically a conjecture uh, when people talk about it. So, because they don't, what they don't tell you is that it's a trace, and what it's emblematic of is that uh, up to 12,000 other isotopes, ionized isotopes, have, uh, is in that general vicinity. But your Geiger counter can find that isotope of iodine or cesium. And so that's why, but it's also, if you look at all the studies, and I have roughly around 60,000 studies on radiation. Very rarely do they refer, well, they always refer to the tracers, and then they extrapolate from the tracers. So from iodine 131 in this picture, uh, the numbers you're looking at is very big, obviously. Well, right away you would extrapolate that there's 10 times more 132 iodine, and 30 times more 133 iodine, and 31 times more iodine 129. The iodine-132-133 ionizes and radiates your thyroid gland nine times more effectively. But cesium also goes in your thyroid gland. So it's not just iodine. That was the old uh, nuclear industry's way of deceiving you, manipulating you. So the solar system has roughly 5,500 elements and about 160 of them are emitters, but none of them are ionized emitters. These are all ionized emitters. This is why we have terrorist laws. This is why we have nuclear waste sites. This is the biggest dirty bomb we've ever seen depicted in uh, recent memory. And But uh, when you think about the fact that they didn't include the meltdown, they didn't include the inventories in the building, they didn't include, say, six reactor cores per, bil per building, let alone the actual reactor cores that were running and melted down per building, 
so uh, you can see the enormity of what we're talking about and how much actually came through. It was estimated that people in – and I got a couple of these headlines, mostly pictures today. But we needed to talk about the cesium-137. There's 100 times more strontium-90 that will go right into your bones. Now, it only takes one isotope to, to, to cause you a cancer. But the cancer doesn't manifest – or get diagnosed for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But before cancer shows up, there's 1,800 autoimmune deficiencies, illnesses, diseases that will show up before the cancer. They, a lot of these will like heart, liver, lung, respiratory, pituitary, adrenaline gland, um, Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, diabetes. These will show up and manifest long before the cancer. But what's going on is that the isotopes gets into your body, and when you have a big cloud coming over your country, you got that in your body. And there's no way to get away from that. Everybody on the planet is in the same boat. And when these scales, now this particular model was from the URAD project. And so you could just link right over to that and then you could look at it all yourself. It's just an aggregate was what E&E News was and is. It's no different than what Drudge Report does. You just aggregate a link over to the original story. Uh, but what it does do is uh, they're knowledgeable and it's a, you're able to aggregate a lot of topics there in chronological orders. This is uh, North America. This is France's IRSN's model. Once again, you would normally just click and go over to that original link. But for time uh, constraints, we'll, we're just going to whip through these couple of the headlines. Uh, so uh, the Norwegian Institute in May uh, gave up on – for some reason, uh, doing the modeling, but they were only using two isotopes from a single reactor. They weren't using the actual meltdown, the melt-throughs. Now, when these reactors melt down, they're consuming steel and rebar and cement, and they're able to create more isotopes than there's actually in the inventory. Once they go into the chain reaction, they're burning at 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Now, see, as this model shows you, Denmark... Uh, North America. Denmark would be over here in that purple. Now, purple is normally the color for potassium. Potassium is something that we're all acclimated through genetic superior selection. Everything on the planet lives in harmony with the potassium. So it's interesting you see those colors shows up uh, because they're not the right color for the isotopes. And so that's another part of the brainwashing. This is um, Seth Dorn. Hello, Seth. Seth's from CBS, and now he's claiming he's inside of a reactor building four that I showed you earlier with the yellow torus to the right of the building. And uh, the inventory was completely gone. The building had detonated, and they had stripped it down. Now, they're claiming in this frame that they're – and this is TEPCO's official picture from three months ago at a public uh, Washington Institute press club saying this was the interior of uh, reactor three. And this was the guy who was telling it. Now, so this should be another picture. Reactor four, I'm sorry. So inside of that building, our media and our uh, the people, the shakers and movers on this planet that talk about Fukushima have refused to come out and acknowledge that that building there does not exist inside of this building. But that is the lie that was perpetrated up on us by our very own media. There was up to seven major journalists uh, that pretend that they were inside of a building that doesn't exist this building doesn't exist uh if that existed they wouldn't have a they wouldn't have uh, all the you wouldn't need an issue what was the problem right why would that be an issue if it looked like that in other words well it's not it, because it looks like this and so it's just in order to stress out that lie okay and so this is uh, reactor three this was uh, just to touch on that one more time this is considered uh, 2 million times worse than any reactor currently on the planet. It's 4,500 times worse than com all combined reactors on the planet. Okay, for context, once again, everything in the top part of the building is missing. All you're seeing is, is about this much of the building at best. And so it detonated it through its um, inventory high into the atmosphere. Now, think of a forest fire. Um, it's able to send its particles right across the ocean. Think of, uh, in Asia, think of automobile pollution, industrial pollution. It is able to add to the index in North America and in Denmark and in UK, uh, for sure, and all around the planet. But particularly in North America, where the wind jet streams come straight across from Japan. But then it goes across North America, and it goes over and splits, goes to UK, uh, European 
and over to Denmark and you know, up towards um, the North Sea. Now, 30 million bags was cleaned up, not because it's like a banana or a potato chip or walking in sunshine. Uh, let me just uh, I digress. Building three was reclaim uranium plutonium. And what they'd done was they took missiles that were already unstable, already gone through a chain reaction. Once anything goes through a chain reaction, it's two million times worse than it was originally before it went into the chain reaction. And what they'd done was they took that stuff now and put it through a chain reaction again. And now it's had sat around in missiles for 40 or 50 years with the fear machine and the money machine. And uh, all of these missiles have to be reloaded every 12 years with tritium. Tritium is uh, the biggest uh, – one of the biggest problems that we have is because they have to reload it. It's, it's released into the atmosphere constantly on purpose. There's no way to contain it. And tritium-3H, uh, man-made, everything that comes out of these reactors, remember, is man-made, is ionized. And if you encounter a single atom – then you will have an autoimmune deficiency over the next decade or so. If that was just a small encounter, we didn't have a small encounter. We had an ongoing endless perpetual release. And so Dr. Raymond Gilmetti, he done small doses to animals. He's from the Loveless Respiratory Research Institute in New Mexico. And for 35 years, Dr. Raymond Gilmetti has produced uh, 94 peer review academic studies. Sorry. Now, one of the most striking things to remember is that curium isotopes, as shown in the compound when used on dogs in the application to the human exposure, application to human exposure, remember those words, folks. Curium isotopes are major byproducts, and so the curium acts just like uh, plutonium on your body. And I'll explain that in another, these are beagle dogs and beagle puppies studies. And they've done this for 35 years. These are ones of thousands. There's millions of studies like this, by the way. And every animal died in every study within about five years. The toxicity of an inhaled plutonium on 144 beagle dogs. And so what was the result of that is definitive uh, because it's emblematic of all the other studies. And that death from the radiation occurred about 1.5 to 5.4 years. Now, they cut the vocal cords out of the animals. They don't give them aesthetics. Uh, they don't give them painkillers. Tumors in the lung, skeleton, and livers occurred beginning about three years after exposure. Three years after exposure. Bone tumors found in 93 dogs were the most common cause of death. Within five years, uh, 93 dogs, 46 dogs were the second. Lung tumors were the most cause of the uh, second most. Liver tumors in 20 dogs were third and occurred later than the tumors in the bones and the lungs. And the tumors in these three organs in particular, there was much more different tumors and leukemias and, and types, uh, but often occurred in the same animal were competing causes of death. So you get multiple tumors from uh, the single monodispersal inhalation. They were given a single monodispersal. So they're not like us where we're eating it in our food and our water. We've seen three uh, over 3,000 polar bears in the Arctic. And some of these will show up in um, Denmark. And these polar bears are emaciated. Now, all the polar bears in the Antarctic are like this. And they, they've never seen nothing like this. Now, I come from the east coast of Canada, from originally from Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada. And so I know I, I've met a lot of people from Denmark in the fishing industry that have uh, came and fished off our coastline and sought shelter in our communities. And I come from a community that still has no automobiles. And so we're very uh, helpful people when it comes to uh, people being blown in storms. And I, I know a lot of these people. I played soccer with a lot of these people. We, and our little community of 170 people. I come from a land that understands the ocean. I've worked at every industry. I have 14,000 hours underwater. I have, uh, when I left the East Coast, I had 30,000 hooks and 120 gillnets. I also have 7,000 lectures on nuclear. And I also have um, this enormous appetite of 5,000 pictures of the reactors. Now, these buckyballs, I, I got to watch because I'll digress. These buckyballs, uh, this depiction, 
What you're looking at now is this phenomenon that was known about in the 40s and the 50s from detonations in Papua New Guinea uh, in Nuclear testing in the ocean is a better way to say it. And so what they discovered was that the sulfur peroxide uh, hydrogen buckyball is what we're talking about and looking at. Phenomenon is, was well established yet we didn't learn about it uh, concerning Fukushima until after. They had sprayed the salt water on the reactor cores. They were burning at around 9,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. And what they done, excuse me, what they done was they created – these little buckyballs, they're able to ingest uh, any up to 12,000 isotopes. But remember, the reactor runs on uranium plutonium, and its biggest product is actually curium isotope, and uh, uranium, obviously, and plutonium. But uh, curium isotope and uranium plutonium, these are bone sinkers. Uh, these are vicious leukemias, autoimmune deficiencies. Um, and these are killer cancers. But uh, this stuff here has this phenomenon, the sulfur peroxide hydrogen buckyball. It, it ingests the uh, atoms with the isotopes in it from the chain reaction or the fission product. And it turns it into a super nuclear engine. And these are, you can put two million of these on the head of a needle. You can't see it. But distributed out, um, that is a guarantee. These are what you call extraordinarily hot particles. With a longevity, they're not solutable in water, and they're highly mobile. You don't need a jet stream for them to make it across the Pacific Ocean. A few days ago, we had Super Typhoon Maranti, who winds at 190 miles per hour and gust up to 230 miles per hour. This is the sixth uh, storm uh, like this that we've seen in the last couple of years. These are uh, phenomena, each of them on their own. We've never seen this on our planet before. It's stripped around 100 million trees that I know about so far. I've been aggregating the documentation now for days relentlessly, uh, and I got some sleep last night finally. I do that after each of these storms. Maranti, um, now when you think about mountain passes, you think about uh, big buildings, you think about big land structures and highway structures. The wind would, would whip around these at around 250, 260 miles per hour. Uh, this is something we've never seen on our planet before, and this is a direct result of uh, Fukushima's multiple melted reactors. But remember, most of the coastline was ripped up where many reactors and common spent fuel pools and waste uh, storage sites were sitting right on the ground. And so they were swept away. And this is, um, this is an event up on our planet, and we're getting to the rest of this. Hundreds ill after Fukushima nuclear plant rubble burned in major Japanese cities. So I just wanted to touch upon the fact that they're burning it in the incinerators throughout the country nonstop since the accident happened. This, um, if someone done that in any other city on the planet, the whole planet would lose its mind. Every media on the planet would freak pre-Fukushima. The whole world would march in the streets uh, just for one of these incinerators doing it. They're doing it right across the entire country. This is liberated... These isotopes are created in the bowels of hell. So 3,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures is not going to destroy them. You're just going to liberate them. If you have an isotope and you pour battery acid over, you cannot destroy it. We don't have the technology uh, in anywhere on this planet to destroy an isotope. We just don't have what it – we are not able to do it. That's why we have terrorist laws, nuclear holding sites. We don't actually have a repository. Uh, is the government trying to contaminate every region of the planet, really, by burning radioactive debris? Because that is the ultimate result. And that uh, the enormity, uh, I cannot uh, stress. Now, what you're looking at, and we're going to start talking about now, is what I've done in the last couple of years in response to these multiple meltdowns. And as you can see, how I aggregate information and how I think about things and how I'm able to... Uh, postulate and go down that road and make sure that I'm right before I open my mouth, so to speak, to be polite, as my sisters would say. Think about it before you open your mouth, Dana. And so since a kid, I've learned that if I didn't want to be scolded or, or reprimanded, then you always thought things out properly before you you uh, come out with your uh, kooky idea. So you were able to back it up relentlessly and not give them any wiggle room was the way to win. But what I done was I decided to go out and look at the entire coastline. So I originally went out for nine days and never told anybody. And I only counted around um, 
of, I don't know, 10 or 12 species that first nine days. I documented it and then I put a video up because I understood what I was looking at. Because I have 14,000 hours underwater in boat oceans in Canada. Uh, I was injured uh, after 128 days straight, uh, six hours a day on the ocean floor, uh, and woke up in a hyperbury chamber and then basically and got out of a hospital bed 10 years later and out of a wheelchair several years after that to go do this. And so 189 species normally would uh, migratory on our coastline in BC. Now I used, uh, went through 15,000 miles. We're going to cover that coming up here right now in more detail. And 260 days on expeditions looking at the tidal zones, the most vulnerable species uh, or the most vulnerable part and the nursery of the ocean was the tidal zones. We have 26,000 islands here in British Columbia and so it's quite a, quite a task so 189 species, we also done bird count, insect counts, along with um, uh, species counts. And here's the basic result, and then I'm going to show you the documentation of that, the trip. 189 species, migratory birds, uh, we only found six of those. Out of the 168 residential, we found five. The mussels would normally cover uh, 80% of the entire coastline, and sometimes, you know, like miles and miles and miles uh, everything is buried in mussels, but uh, less than one tenth of a percent of the coverage was mussels of the whole coastline. In barnacles, you would find 90 percent of the coastline. We found one percent coverage documented in a couple of hundred thousand pictures. That um, the Clintons on the coastline, uh, we only seen babies. I'm sorry, two adults. Uh, out of the whole coastline and most but we did see a lot of babies which was rare and one of the few species we did see of babies uh, periwinkles snails uh, little to none and these are um, very you normally would see like 500 on a rock the size of your coffee table was uh, normal and you would see four to five hundred species in a tidal pool average now you see two to seven species hang on I smurfed the wrong way oh um just one moment, please. Should have been in that one. There we go. And so pre and post Fukushima, pre, uh, let's go back to that other one is where I wanted to be. So the tide zones in BC, Canada, pre, post, pre, uh, 480 species of worms. Uh, post was four species. Pre, 600 algae, kelps. Uh, some places would have an extra 100 or more. Post uh, was 30 species coast wide when you added it all up. Uh, there should be around 6,500 invertebrates without the backbones. Uh, at best, I found 10 species. Uh, sea anemones, these are, and we're going to show you these pictures uh, that are coming up here. 78 species of sea anemones of the pre and post uh, pictures of the coastline of BC to really to, to, to nail this home for you. Pre was 78 species, a post was seven species. None of them were thriving. These are, each species come in multiple colors, multiple sizes, very visible, highly dominant. You can get up to 500 per square meter. We'll show you uh, pictures of that very quick here and we'll move to questions at that stage. We're about 10 minutes away from finish on this side and hopefully we'll be able to get some questions in because I think that's so important. 76 species of starfish, and now these are the highly visible species we're talking about today. There's 4.2 million other species in the Pacific coastline. Now, I found five species of starfish coastwide, and that was some serious hunting to find that. We found no young starfish. Okay, now let's go into the pictures, and I smurfed that up right away. Each of the folders on my desktop... Uh, you wouldn't believe the collections, the way I collect and organize. And <laughs> it's, some days I can bring in 500 pieces of information on a subject, but how do you process that and tell that story, you know? <clears throat> it's very difficult, uh, trust me. And so I, that's why I do it. I find the best one out of 500 and, and to tell that story, basically. And that's as years go by, I get really good at doing stuff like that. But I still collect up to 500 pieces for myself. I have to convince myself uh, that uh, that is worthy to be told and needs to be told. And, and then it has to be told right 
and how do you hold someone's attention long enough to do it is a struggle. This is the coastline of British Columbia, Canada, 15,000 miles, 260 days. The arrows are the representations of the sacrifices that we made to get there and survey and document it is all free uh, at my website. You can make documentaries with it. Um, you can get the copyright. You got any issues? You contact me at my email, Dana Dernford at hotmail dot com, and I will respond and I will give you that permission. And you can take that and you can monitorize it and to do your own document documentaries if it be, if you think it's useful for you. And uh, what we're talking about coming up is a sacrifice. Uh, for many people around this planet to see this through. And I wouldn't come home. I spent up to five months. Uh, this is uh, the pictures we're going to see is before and after from the same area. And that's the GPS of that area. And I hope that is really clean enough for everybody to be able to look it up later. It's called Louise Narrows. And what I this is a big island in the middle of nowhere. And just to give you a context, it's up here. And it's right in the center of your screen, basically. That error in P on that big island. So it floods through there. It's notoriously gorgeous. And we'll show you those before pictures. This is pre-Fukushima, what it would look like there. So every millimeter is jostling with life, and you'll understand that. And just under the surface of the water, low tide, you see these white sea anemones, they would dominate the low tide zone specifically. And you can get up to 500 per square meter on a rock. And these are, uh, this is a normal, this is what I normally expect to see. This is why I was a commercial diver for 14,000 hours. And uh, this is me on the beach. This is me on the beach, and I think we're missing a picture should have went up here to do it first. So we built this operation to go out and take on the coastline up to five months without coming home. You got to realize that in California after, in March, in less than a couple of weeks, there was 40 million beckles of iodine-131 in a single bed of kelp off of California. Now in Germany, they were packing the food away at five beckles or material or gloves or hammers. It was contaminated at five beckle. Uh, in France, pre-Fukushima, it was 17 beckles. So 40 million beckles is definitely something significant. Now, this iodine-131 has an eight-day half-life. And so it was assumed that that came from the reactors because the jet streams are real and the ocean currents are actually real. Now, I use that terminology not as an offense to you people sitting here in the audience, but as defense for uh, – but as a defense – against uh, the many uh, PR firms that insist upon trying to muddle the water. So pre-Fukushima, I hit the beach, there's nothing left in the same spot. And so the next pictures are based upon that. So you can see at low tide how visible this uh, compared to what it's like now. This is both the same place as pre and post Fukushima. So pre Fukushima, you would expect a very thriving. This is what I've been there like this many, many times. The entire coastline of Canada is like that was. Uh, and so the 4.2 million other species didn't take up residence for some reason. Now, of course, these are the lowest tides of the year when I'm there. Uh, so there's nothing I didn't do right. And that we sacrificed, we wrecked up on the rocks up here in hurricanes. I've done thousands and thousands of dollars worth of damage to the operation. I went ashore, rebuilt it, and headed back out again because I was horrified. I had to, I was looking for an oasis. This is what I'm, I'm expecting to see wherever I go. This is what I, when you go ashore at low tide, it's the most scariest thing imaginable. You don't want to tread on the life, and it's dangerous if you do. Uh, this is the colors I'm used to. This is the vibrant world that I thrived on. This is why I was the, I spent my whole life at, on the ocean. This is what made me tick. This is what um, the only thing I understand. So when I see a bird, this is what the bird is supposed to go wherever he wants, and there's this complete habitat, this ecosystem. Now the bird has nothing there to eat or to live in, or he doesn't have that environment. This is within a couple of years. So normally in Louise Narrows, this is all from the same pre-post Fukushima pictures. This is why people came from all over the world to come to Louise Narrows. This is one of the most famous spots in Canada. 
And when I was there last year, this is what it looked like. This was the accumulation of five months straight. Uh, we had originally, I didn't go on the boat at all. I sent out three people originally. But because of the pictures they were bringing back, I was horrified. I had to go out and see it myself. So when you come ashore and you see this, what, what would, you know, if you don't never see and experience this before, even if you did, but if you never experienced this before, can will that not take your breath away? Will that not, like, you know, what do I do next, folks, because I've never seen, do I walk on this? or Like, you have all these things in your mind. You have all this life at your fingertips. When you walk ashore now, that picture should have been cleaner. But when you walk ashore now, you're not going to slip. You're not going to fall. There's nothing to look. There's nothing to take a picture of. You would never take this picture again. The 4.2 million other species didn't come in and re-steer go cleaner. The 4.2 million other species on this post-Fukushima picture didn't take advantage of it. A couple of algaes you see, if they disappear, the rocks will be naked like the moon. If those couple of algaes that are left hanging on disappear, there will be nothing left. And so, sorry, click back. This narrow, this low tide, super low tide, uh, is definitive that uh, we've had an event. And that the whole coastline of Canada, after 260 days, I only identified 100 species, and that none of these were thriving, uh, was the reason why I'm here today. The reason I worked so hard to get this message out there, to tell that story, so that because we got to realize we had an event and we better start making concessions and making we have to throw off these shackles uh, and restrictions and constraints of um, silence where we are silence we think our voice don't matter we think we we can't be an impactor or haven't or we don't have what it takes maybe or we don't we can't gut up whatever the case may be. But what you're looking at is I can take every one of you right here on that day and feed every one of you. And you can come back in a week's time. You won't be able to see any kind of impact because there's so much there. It would have filled up that spot. If you plowed it in, it would have came in from both sides and filled it back up. It would have came up from deeper. The ocean itself is a soup of life. And so a glass of water should be able to seed all of that. A glass of water is a billion creatures. And the glass of uh, water in the ocean is um, seems uh, you know incontestably small, but when you take a, the amount of life into it, in a glass of salt water in the ocean would be 75 to 100 million of that would be phytoplankton, the basis of the food chain, the carbon sequestering chain, the oxygen chain, 50 uh, percent of the oxygen on the planet. But there would be all the eggs and larvae and all the little mussels and the little starfish and little oysters. And an oyster could lay 11 uh, billion eggs, 11 million eggs rather. And a codfish can lay seven million eggs, and or seven hundred thousand eggs, and but you can see, you know, how the ocean is this soup of life, and yet it didn't recede the coastline, and that the couple of species are left. If they disappear, there truly will be nothing left here, and that these pictures pre, I'm sorry, post Fukushima. When you look at, it's just the the life, the color, the diversity. The smell. This is what I loved. This is what I thrived on. This is why I'd done 128 days straight on the ocean. It's because I couldn't get enough of that. I couldn't, I could never. But to come and see this, to come in and, and now I hung out with the commercial divers for two months on this coastline uh, while I was here. I used them as a floating fuel dock. And, you know, I got dear input on it. And so it's such, I get how it's such a hard topic to broach. I get all of that, trust me. I get how it's such a hard topic to explain. Believe you me, I get how it's hard to sit there with people and try to get them interested. Now, I I was rejected repeatedly originally because, but once you show them the pictures, right, because they see it in increments over five years and, and they're drunk they're high on making $50,000 an hour. That's right, $50,000 an hour as divers. They're making contracts to go out for six weeks to make a million dollars. This is real money, you know, and I sat there with them. These are my old my old friends who I knew before I got injured. And so I, I had that camaraderie that where I was able to 
just not say things so much as be around them all day doing my research, pulling up alongside them all the day and talking to them and introducing them that uh, that is the end of life, this, this world as they know it, and that everything that you're feeding the people is uh, you're, you're, you're ultimately hurting that person and giving them cancer down the road. And so how do you tell your friends not to do that no more? How do you tell them that they can't go out there and make a million dollars a year for six weeks' work? How do you do that? Well, I went up and tried. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll tell you a little bit about why, you know, when I, when I explained to them, when they give me an opportunity, they can't hide away from me anymore. So I win them over in increments over time. And then when I leave, I know that after that, it'll resonate for them. And after that, they'll look at my material and understand that I, I was only doing what I knew I had to do and, I, and it was for their benefit and everybody else's too and that I didn't want the job. <laughs> I don't want this job, trust me. But this is what it used to look like. We're almost through it. Another minute or so. Um, these colors, see, I would pick 20,000 of them a day when I was harvesting the red sea, purple sea urchin. And you can see that uh, sea cucumbers, we would pick them all day long uh, at different times of year during the uh, seasons. Before, I was there to before it was seasons when it was open coastline. See, this is my old friend. Every millimeter is uh, taken up with some kind of life. In between that is not rocks, but life. Uh, that is the habitat that I understand. That is the only thing I know. That is what I grew up uh, thriving on. And I come from that world. Look at it. That's not there no more. It'll never be there again. That is the pre-Fukushima. And um, that's the end of that one there. So we'll switch back over. And just a one quick look to make sure we showed everything that we had lined up for everybody. And we did. And, was, you know, and, and I had this ready weeks ago and I made all kinds of changes up to now. Because I knew we, we had constraints because of Skype. And I knew we had constraints. Um, I knew we had... Okay, here we go. We'll get back up to the big screen in a second. Let me double check. Hi, Frank. Am I back up full screen? Um... I still got you edited screen. It doesn't matter. Okay. Does anybody want to try questions? I know we covered such a wide spectrum. And I know it's such a difficult subject. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Dana. Can you hear me? Uh, you're a little bit scrambled. Okay. I will. I'll uh, try. Yeah. I can hear you, but... Thank you very much, Dana, for, for your lecture. I'm sure there are some questions, but uh, I think uh, the audience want to give you a hand before we start that. Thank you. Good stuff. Go ahead. Uh, kudos to you, Donna. Um, good work. Great work. I'm a former commercial fisherman too. Um, diver. Uh, I'm from New Zealand. And I'm very concerned about the issues with Fukushima and, and the spread of radiation throughout the world through through the Pacific Ocean. And I'm quite curious to know um, the effects it's going to have on the on the pelagic fish and the migratory fish. Um, the alva that are um, spawned in, in the northern 
Pacific and then migrate to the southern hemisphere and, and how it's going to affect our ecosystems down south. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking. Sorry? Yeah. No, I couldn't hear it. I was trying. Yeah, um, well, the, the krill, the shrimp, the herring, the anchovies, the sardines, the basis of the, the bigger food chain, the, the migratory birds, the mammals, the animals are dependent upon, the coastline the animals are dependent upon, uh, have taken a serious uh, hit for um, the Pacific. And that we've seen the plume went right around the planet. It never stopped coming out. It's still coming out of these multiple meltdowns. And so we, we know that from people I talked to down there that they suspect uh, there is some serious impact there. I haven't been able to aggregate it, uh, so I can't really comment on it. But from what I understand unofficially, that uh, they, they were seriously impacted by the loss of the food chain. And so the, and there is uh, radiation numbers did increase down there atmospherically, uh, counts per minute. I don't know if you can see the Geiger counter in my background. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's about 106 is shown. It's going to pop up to around 200 back and forth. That's a Unisiever uh, per minute, basically, numbers. And what that means, and you're seeing that in, in uh, New Zealand and Australia, these times, kind of same kind of numbers showing up, is that in France, they were putting the food away at five, Beckwells, so five of these numbers. And uh, so, yeah, you were highly impacted. That would have mean you would have had disposition over your vegetables right after the accident, in particular the animals, uh, the milk coming out of there would have been definitely, same thing with Denmark, would have been highly radioactive, would have been very, very dangerous stuff, and still is probably, a, a lot of these animals are still alive and producing right now, and should have been taken out of the the, the chain itself and allowed to live out their lives. But, um, and then, you know, we are in real trouble, absolutely, uh, worldwide, no one escaped it. Um, uh, my name is uh, Thorsten. Um, I um, I'm from Copenhagen. I I, I know that uh, this te Tepco company, they also stored a lot of water, not only soil that you mentioned in your lecture, but uh, a lot of that water has also leaked out into the ocean, and and uh, and and that's still still going on as far as I know. But my question is. Uh, what what has why is not more colleagues like you uh, speaking up in Japan? Uh, what what is the wildlife in the oceans? What what is it looking? What's what is that looking like in in uh, Japan right now? Um, well, first off, I got 14,000 headlines, so I'm not the only one speaking up. Uh, in that context, right, uh, we do have a lot of scientists amongst those that material, academics. We have a lot of studies uh, where people have spoken out and never got no traction and didn't get lost and didn't get any um, – and didn't get uh, passed around, and that you know it's such a difficult subject. So a lot of the people, uh, I'm always looking, but it is hard to find someone like myself. Absolutely, um, and that water uh, is constantly poured on there, and will be till the end of time. The site uh, itself is built up on a uh, side of a mountain, and so it has a is built up on an old riverbed. An old riverbed exists because. Uh, it had washed itself down to the bedrock over millenniums. So it was a well-worn path all the way from the mountain underground down to that bedrock. Uh, and so building the plant over that was a backup plan. So in case the reactors melt down, you hit the bedrock and the water's running over it. This is a similar design we see many times over. Um, but um, the water that they're spraying over it all day long is the stuff they're putting in the tanks. 
the rainwater and the snow melt and all the other stuff, the typhoons and that, they're not collecting that stuff and putting it in tanks. They're just putting in, they're pumping around 600 tons a day of water from hoses on, on to, into the reactor buildings on the melted cores. They can't get near it, but allegedly they're doing that. And so 300 tons of that goes into the tanks. And, but everything else goes straight out into the ocean, uh, into the water tables, fresh water tables also of Japan. For, the, for at least 3,000 years, that'll go full speed, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to babysit that for the thousands. Uh, at least 3,000 years, uh, I, I figure by then the last human will be gone from this, and the last species on the planet will definitely be gone by then for sure. But um, we're, what we're looking at right now is we look at an extinction event for the Pacific Ocean, because it is. And so even if you switched it off right now, you couldn't say the Pacific Ocean, but we have to switch it off. And so what you're talking about is the most important thing imaginable because we have to switch that off. We, no matter what I talk about and show you today, none of them really matters. we gotta, we got to stop those reactors, right? Knowing what I'm talking about is, just means that you got to work 10 times hard to make us – got to stop these reactors. We sent in 600,000 people into Chernobyl, uh, troops, conscripted, and around 400,000 tradespeople because they'd done that back then, but we didn't do that now. And so we would probably have to sacrifice 6 million people – to, uh, you you will die pretty quickly if you go in there because the rods are all over the site. And so if you just walk through the site, physically get in that area where they didn't plow it on the ground and put 10 feet of cement and the pavement on top of it is what, is what they done, 8 to 10 feet of that on top of the rods. They plowed it on the ground because uh, the x-rays and neutrons, the gamma shine. So about a week later, your organs will melt and uh, you will die two weeks later or something, a month later. And if you walk past that stuff, that's why, they, that's why they're going, they can't find any more homeless or immigrants. They say there's no immigrants, to low numbers. No, they're killing them. They're getting them at the borders and everything else and bringing them into Fukushima. They're being Shanghai. Uh, where, they've done this before. There's buses. They went out in the UK for Sellafield with buses, went to the theater and took the two back rows of the theater to go into Sellafield, wind scale, it was wind scale back then, to go in there and push the fuel rods out of the reactor core because the 5,000 employees wouldn't do it. So they, they went into a theater and took your loved ones and went to a nuclear <laughs> reactor and made them go in and push the fuel rod out. Uh, I show that clip all the time. So it shows you, it shows you how dangerous this stuff is, but also we know how, how we, you know, the studies on the dogs and the animals I showed earlier, that kind of tells you everything you need to know about it. Every animal died in every study. These were human comparison tests, all of them, by the way. You expect the same results in humans. Okay. Uh, we kind of digress, I know. Hi, this is, my name is Anne-Marie Erie. I have a pupil that's been working for a nuclear plant for many, many years, and he teaches um, this, what was happening over there, that's what he teaches. Uh, he told me that there were three men, if I got this right, there were three men um, that were supposed to just close one door, one lid, and this would never have happened, but they, did, they refused to go in. Is this true? Do you know? Just uh, three men. Could you repeat that for me? No. Yeah, no, that's not true. Now, you had a tsunami come through the country. You took out all the telephone poles. Once you take out the power, then the, the poles will boil off. The pool's got 10 years of fuel into it. They'll boil off. Then this stuff has to be kept underwater because it will catch fire. And that the fuel, the fumes that it's creating doesn't need a spark, it just needs oxygen. And so it was inevitable that this would happen there. But uh, reactor uh, cores are put on the ground also in what's known as a common spin fuel pool. But the reactors will melt down, detonate, catch fire. And so the, there was allegations that the reactor buildings detonated or were on fire before the tsunami got there from just the earthquake. And because the cooling, you have to pump in a million gallons a minute. 
And if you stop that, and because the tsunami blocked all that up and tore all of these pumps and, and the fins off it and everything, so irrelevant of everything else, that would have. Um, uh, and but when the buildings blew up, there was no way to get uh, power in there, say for instance, and that there was so much inventory there, everybody ran away. And so, yeah, I'm not sure what you were talking about or what you were told, but uh, unfortunately, no, I wish it was that simple. It's it's not, unfortunately. They sent in 600 helicopter pilots. They all died in Chernobyl shortly after from the... Uh, acute radiation illnesses but uh yeah i think there is ways to stop it i, I am planning on now starting up a robotics con company to take on some of those uh challenges and um i'm not sure how i'm going to pull that one off but i do feel compelled that i, I should have an input on this because i am a fanatic on when it comes to robots my whole life and so i have aggregated an enormous uh, I have literally everything that was ever put on the internet about robots for the last 10 years gathered up on just its own hard drive. Uh, I was just one of those geeky people who really, uh, I feared them more so than anything else, so I wanted to know everything about it just in case. <laughs> now, you could bombard it with a neutron or with some kind of, I'm sorry, they use tritium for some reactors to actually as a, uh, to stop the neutron. Uh, to absorb the neutrons, so you, so you would use bor boratic boron. Uh, just different different te techniques. You would just use the, these different uh, rods type material, uh, depending on what they were using. Because like reactor three was different than reactor one and two. It was a different type of mixture. And we we suspect plutonium was in all. We do have documentation by the way plutonium was in all the reactors. And so it looks like, you know, so it depends upon the fuel cycle, what you're going to use. So you would bomb it with the normal stuff. This is what they've done. They drop lead out of the helicopters and boric acid out of the helicopters for 10 days. Now, think about it. It did stop. We don't, and they say it wasn't from doing that, but they also don't tell you about the 600 helicopter pilots. Harvard did. That's where I picked it up to at Harvard. But uh, you won't see it at UN. You won't see IRPA, UNSCLEAR or the major atomic energy agencies talking about the 600 helicopter pilots that died, which is suspect, really, because it appeared that the chain reaction did stop in Chernobyl, but that was equal to 400 Hiroshima bombs. It was one-third the size and a 30% meltdown, and they threw a million people at it. In Japan, it's around 350,000 thrown at it that we uh, allude to, but we know we have crematories of, uh, of workers, homeless workers, where they incinerated their bodies well, let's put it this way. A pound of it will kill everybody that's sitting there right now within 20 minutes. If there was uh, 1,500 people there, it would kill you all in 20 minutes. It will kill everybody on the planet in increments of 20 minutes. If you had 5 million buildings and you got 1,500 people to walk in each of these 5 million buildings, you kill everybody on the planet at the same time in 20 minutes. Uh, uh, but that one piece, one pound, could do that to everybody on the planet every 20 minutes, get rid of 1,500 people till the end of time. And then it can get rid of all the animals till the end of time. And then in a billion years, a whole new species could show up here and can get rid of all of them. So by proxy, it should never be on the planet because nothing on the planet has any kind of defense for it. That's why we have the – I'll let it go at that. That's why we have the terrorist laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I understand that the planet is more or less contaminated all over. Is there anything we can do to protect ourselves, or do we just sit and wait to get cancer? Yeah, uh, so spices like turmeric, uh, turmeric has 1,600 studies on it, and you can even put it on cuts to get uh, smaller scars, but it's, uh, you can put it on any kind of scratch or cut. It's really good for it. So turmeric, spices like that, organic food, you, you have to stay away from GMO, genetically modified food. It has toxins, deoxins, glossophates, formaldehydes engineered directly into the DNA of it. And what that does is it stops you from uptaking the nutrients, the micro, the macro. And now another thing you want to look up is structured water. 
Structured water is like mountain water, spring water. This is what your body is designed for. It's not designed for chemically treated water. But, but structured water is just the way it, it, it reorganizes its molecules. And But you can, you can buy a machine that will actually uh, put it back to its original structure. Scientists don't know why it does that, but they know how to make it come back. And structured water unplates your blood. And so um, organic foods only, don't eat anything GMO, don't eat chocolate bars that are GMO aspartanes or, or drinks or stuff like that, because it takes up to two weeks for that stuff before your body can stop up taking nutrients. And so what you're trying to do, like, like dandelion has every mineral in it that your body needs, a dandelion. And so what you want to do is keep that stuff into your body and that unplates your blood, and that makes it really hard for cancer to work and then uh, by proxy uh, it keeps the pH of your body normal and keeps those 1800 autoimmune deficiencies that pay but but yeah you, and another way to change the structure of the water you like this one is you pray to it you thank the water now they've done experiments where if you've done that uh, structured water for instance your plants will grow 30% quicker 30% more foliage and uh, mature 30% uh, like you say quicker and you'll get 30% more product so, and it's a better product, a more healthier product. It resists insects naturally type product. Body is truly like that too. I hope that helps. you got to look into that kind of stuff. Turmeric, a dandelion, and water. And get rid of, get rid of uh, bad choices. Don't, don't drink milk. Uh, just get away from it. We're not designed for it at this age anyway. Only children are designed for milk. And so we're just acclimated to it in, in increments over decades and ice cream and everything else. But our body does react to it, trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can eat. You can yeah, eat that stuff. You can buy the edible stuff, and that'll help aggregate it out of your body. There's um, that's something you got to look into. There's not a lot of products on that, but you want to go after. You want to look at your penile gland. You want to look at your thyroid glands. You want to look at your adrenaline glands. You want to look up research on how to purge that and clean that, because your glands are really vulnerable. They're not like organs. But they're very, 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 very important. They regulate the temperature of your body. They regulate the adrenaline in your body. They regulate just the well-being of your body and all these glands are the most important thing. And they got a tendency to aggregate it. You're, once again, there's 4,300 peer review studies published every day in North America. So if we were to turn up some of that horsepower, we can come up with solutions for food. You should consider planting organic food in every community we should get rid of the pesticides and plant organic food everywhere so insects and animals and everything got some habitat and food and we can eat it too and that is truly going to make the biggest difference to you is uh, protecting your food getting a greenhouse growing your food being diligent keep the door closed you can't escape it do the best you can that's good enough trust me that that is good enough but if you ignore it and you don't take care of yourself, this stuff is bioaccumulating in you and it's going to take the good out of you. You will liquidate your assets over the next five and ten years uh, because of this regardless. And so if you if you take care of yourself now, you prepare for the worst and it's coming. There's no offense or buts about it. We can't stop the chain reaction. We won't do what it takes. We won't even admit that we got an issue. We pretend, that, like I showed you earlier, that the billing is perfect. This is what everybody thinks that's out there. This is what the media is portraying. And so we're not willing to deal with it because to, to admit it would be so horrific, but to not admit it is even worse. It is the stupidest thing imaginable. We can't hide away from it. Remember those winds, 230 miles per hour? If they hit your community, that's going to level everything. You know that. I know that. And so we got to stop these things before. We can't stop what it's doing now, but we can stop it from being worse. We got to stop the reactors and take care of our souls and our friends and the insects and the animals left. Out of 30,000 insects, I maybe found 30 species. On top of that, I never mentioned. And the ice is gone from the mountains, by the way. 
the glacier ice is gone. It might take a million years for that to come back or 5,000 years. But in the last five years, that disappeared right to the Rocky Mountains. It's gone. And so that regulated the estuaries, the streams, the rivers. And you'll see that happening all over the world because the radiation is gets into the troposphere, the lower and upper troposphere. It takes 10 years to rain out, but it's never stopped coming out of those reactors. And so all of these are not uh, premonitions or anything. These are factual. This is just pure facts is all we're talking about. And so it's brutal, I know, and we don't have the extra time to, to, or to, that we have to tell it like it is, see, unfortunately, today. And uh, there's no way to hide away from this stuff, folks, and we and we got to deal with it. And that's why I work so hard to do the things I'm doing. Uh, by the way, you know, I was arrested when I came ashore. They stacked up a couple of charges against me at a university that I was criticizing for claiming it was like a banana. And when I came ashore, I was smeared in the media through Canada and North America. And that trial it happens in a couple of days. That's why I couldn't make it there today. And I have to be in trial for three days. Not that they're going to show up, but it was about smearing me. And what they done was, I'll just end it on that, was that the two videos I'm accused of being salacious in, it's not a big deal when you think about it. The two videos I'm accused of being salacious in, why I was in jail for 12 hours, because the police didn't pick me up until it was ready to, the day before trial. They didn't see any sense of me sitting around, because they know me. And what they done was, though, they used that to bludgeon uh, me, and try to bludgeon me with, but they knocked the videos down that I was accused of with ghost accounts in that 12-hour period I was in jail, and when I got out, they had a court order to take down 300 of these presentations, just like you watch today, no different. But sometimes I'll say some pretty salacious stuff. I'm from the East Coast, and but nothing I said will I take back. Nothing I said is not political hyperbole. Nothing I said was uh, out of context. And the fact that the court recently barred me from using the videos to defend myself that I'm accused of in the video – Tells you the whole story. <laughs> so they're terrified the judge will see the whole video. They won't allow the video. And so it's not even going to go to trial. But I, I spent 12 hotel rooms, 12 theories so far dealing with this in a completely different jurisdiction, 3,000 kilometers on my vehicle altogether, thousands and thousands of dollars, and he smeared me in the media. So you wouldn't listen to me. So you wouldn't be able to to put that aside. Oh, he, he, he he's not a nice person, but I actually am. I'm just a normal, and I'm not very, I'm not healthy enough to hurt somebody, for instance. I'm not healthy enough. I can barely walk. I just spent 15 years in a hospital bed. I'm still in a hospital bed. And um, I'm just you. I'm everybody. I'm emblematic of this planet. Did I heard the planet crying for someone to go do something. That's why, why I exist in every sense of that word. Somebody prayed hard enough, I heard it, in that context, where I felt uh, I felt I should do it because I was in the position. I'm in BC. I'm right across. I took on that whole coastline. That's free for everybody also at my website. We'll let you go at that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, and Frank, and everybody who organized it, and the people that are there. I wish I had I got the opportunity to meet you. I truly do, and you have no idea. But this was close enough. It is. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, great work, uh, heartbreaking uh, information, uh, definitely. Um, I, I have been following this group of uh, Japanese journalists and uh, scientists, uh, seismologists, that has this theory that um, the Mm, tsunami wasn't caused by an earth earthquake, actually. It was caused by nukes. Do you have any opinion on this theory? Do you know about it? And do you have any uh, opinion on, uh, on this? They have shown from seism seismic... Uh, diagrams. Uh, yeah, seismic uh, diagrams uh, that um, there were no uh, uh, pre-occurring um, uh, shakes like that, that there are um, normally in a, in a natural uh, earthquake uh, and they have a theory that it, it, it was nukes that caused the event. What, what is your opinion on that?
I did. I investigated that uh, severely, uh, extensively, um, uh, methodically, and relentlessly. Uh, and I didn't find um, it warranted any more research after. And what I looked at, uh, the, the tsunami was created, it was a 170-mile wide chunk that broke off. And that, uh, that happens all the time. Uh, Japan actually gets uh, up to 1,000 earthquakes a year. And many major ones are happening just offshore all the time. It's it's known as a hot zone anyway. It's a tectonically uh, active, very, very highly active, uh, inappropriate place, to, by the way, to have any reactors whatsoever, just because of the volatility of that particular shelf. And that... Um, there was a lot of uh, people saying the earthquake didn't happen. There was all kinds of uh, misdirection. This is typical, atypical of the corporate personhood industry behind it. The nuclear industry, there's a million corporations dependent upon it, uh, sucking off its tits, so to speak, L literally and figuratively in every sense of the word. Just a, a parasite upon uh, humanity is what the nuclear industry is. It's a bridge to hell, a bridge to nowhere, and, and a bridge you don't want to cross. The bridge that's not supposed to be crossed, and the whole history is predicated upon lies and manipulations, deception, and uh, obfuscation of any kind of a moral compass or any kind of reality. And then the people that are involved in this are so educated, so thoroughly certified, it seems highly improbable and not impossible that they don't know any better. Uh, that um, it is a conspiracy in every sense of the word there. But the shelf, life, the shelf coast broke off, took it 400 kilometers of the coastline. You didn't need a conspiracy after that. You lost the power, the inventories, the reactors were doomed to go down. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'll never roll it out. Never roll anything out. I couldn't find any evidence to support it. I did look at it extensively. I did come out and assert that before in a uh, presentation for one hour with the documentation. And that... I wish it was. I wish it was, uh, in one sense, something simple like that, but it wasn't. Thank you very much. Shall we give uh, Dana a big hand? Thank you, folks. Hugs for everybody. My apologies once again. I have so many restrictions. There was nothing I can do about it. But I would have loved to come down and meet anybody, let alone everybody. Hugs for you, Frank and Karen and everybody else there. And uh, I guess that's it for me today. I wish I was there to hear everybody desperately. And so I'm sure Frank will provide me with that later when he gets it sorted out. Look, thank you. Thank you. Hugs for everybody. I'm gone. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Heavy stuff. And me working with environment, I'm uh, yeah, I have no words for it. We uh, we need to talk to a lot of people about this because uh, I think there's only rings in in the water who can try to put push you. So uh, put some uh, authority. Uh, if you have any friends, anybody working in environmental department or anything, try to push them. We will upload this very fast on our homepage, uh, our YouTube channel, so we can spread it around because I think uh, everybody here sees that this is a very serious matter. Thank you very much for participating. We now have a break again and have to be ready seven 30, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>